Uh, I'm really excited to introduce uh, a friend of mine who I'm getting to know really, really well. Uh, the thing that I appreciate uh, after getting to know Darren and being a part of a couple of movies is the guys I'm getting close to. Uh, they love their families and they love Jesus and they're real humble. And man, that's really refreshing. I think it's possible to be a great man or woman of God and not lose your family along the way. Yeah. Robbie's a good dude, vulnerable guy, uh, and a powerhouse. And you're in for a big time treat. He's an awesome preacher too. And uh, I, I introduce you today, I want to show Bridgeway honor, not just to a powerhouse, but a friend of the Father. He's a gentle giant with a tender heart, and the enemy really doesn't like this guy. So you're in for a treat. Stand up and welcome with me, Robbie Dawkins. Bless you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Awesome. Wow. I told the first service this, but I think you may have them beat. You guys look good. <laughs> good looking bunch here. Look around at yourselves. Okay. <laughs> uh, just being Southern, I get it, yeah. That's the reason why every time I pray for people, I'm like, now don't be nice to me. Tell me the truth. You know, I've, been, I've, I've grown up around Southern hospitality. And so I'm like, you know, don't be like, people are like, oh, it's okay. And I'm like, what number is it at? It's like, it went from a 10 to a 20, but that's okay. I have to readjust because of having been in the North. It's been a real treat to be here and um, just to be with you. And I really hope that you appreciate your pastors. You had me worried there for a second. You weren't clapping fast enough right there. That got me a little bit worried. You better appreciate them. Take your time, right? If you don't, <laughs> I will beat you up. I will pray for your healing afterwards. I'm just kidding. I won't pray for your healing afterwards. <clears throat> Man, these guys deserve double honor, and always give it to them. You do that, you'll go far, and you'll be blessed beyond measure. I assure you that. Um, a couple of things, just let me share with you that we've got, uh, just as, as uh, Chad mentioned, uh, we've got some resources back there. You know, whenever you come in and do like a conference, you can only hit on so much stuff, and there's tons of things back there. We've got jump drives with weeks of teaching, both in video and audio, and, and several CD and DVD sets back there and all that stuff helps us to be able to go do missions trips that are near and dear to my heart and I've, I've been in, had the privilege of ministering in 47 different countries and and I, I I'm very passionate about missions and stopped right beside the missions table there with uh, the folks from India bless them and and uh, encourage them uh, two books that I wrote the first book uh, titled do what Jesus did the premise of the book is Jesus didn't just to come he didn't come and just show us what he could do. He came to show us what we could do. He came as the second Adam to reinstate what the first Adam had given away in dominion, power, and authority, and to bring us back into that place, all of that stemming out of relationship with the Father, and to bring us back into that place of, of operating in that authority, you know, coming from that relationship. And, you know, uh, you, so many people think, I, I was being interviewed by a, a DJ in, in Scotland, and he's like, well, you, you say we can do all the same stuff Jesus did. The only problem is we're not Jesus. And I'm like, who lives inside of you? And he's like, well, Jesus. And I said, and what was the source of Jesus' power? Holy Spirit. You've got all the ingredients living in you to do the same stuff Jesus did. We just got to activate it. We just got to release it. We just got to put it into action. So you're not waiting for more. It's, it's been given to you. It's been released to you. We just got to put it into action. And so this is really talking about how to do that. Now, we, we sort of subtitled it as a field guide. And uh, the whole objective is to give you this filled with stories and experiences and uh, things uh, just that I, I've lived out in my life and seen. And, and, and we don't, how many of you know there's no happy meal size Holy Spirit? There's no junior-sized Holy Spirit. There's only one Holy Spirit. And so, you know, it, that same Holy Spirit, you know, lives in you. So, you know, we just need to release it, let it go. Second book is Identity Thief. 
And this book really exposes the lies of the enemy that we've believed and stopping that we're and thinking that we're not good enough. It's stopping those lies and how do we achieve stuff, things that we stop. You know, we've, we've talk, several people talked about this week about not trusting your feelings. Your feelings will lie to you. Your feelings will lie to you. And so you, you can't trust your feelings. You know, you can't just go by feelings because they'll lie to you. They'll deceive you. And, they'll, and you'll, you'll begin to embrace them as your identity. And this really gets into understanding those things, not just in feelings, but in several things that are just around us and, and really seeing that. But this, this, there's a lot of my personal pain, my wife's personal pain that is in this book that we sort of, you know, come out with, bring the surface and sort of expose and unmask the enemy uh, in our lives to, to get to that true place of identity. And so that it, it's a book that's been really helpful for a lot of people in those. We're doing something just special for you guys. These are normally 15 bucks each. If you get both of them today, we'll give them to you for 25. So that's a, a, a discount for you. If I know Southerners, they like deals. So there's a deal for you right there. I grew up in the South mostly. My, my, my dad was from Valdosta, Georgia. And And uh, my, 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 uh, my mother was from Colorado, but uh, she, she quickly adapted. Uh, and so anyway, so I grew up a, a lot in the South. But I, I, I want to talk to you today. I want to share with you uh, just a couple of things and, and kind of get into, I want to delve into some things. When I planted my church, um, I planted in a uh, in a poor urban uh, community, and, and uh, we, we planted there. Uh, because, you know, my parents growing up, they had also, when they came off the mission field, they went to Atlanta, and they went to a section of Atlanta that was really the hood, and, um, and, and then later, uh, they, they did some ministry in Dallas, where, Dallas, Texas, where they were also there, and then ended up coming back to Atlanta, so I've sort of been, you know, back and forth in, in those sort of settings, and I remember always saying, I'm, I'm never going to go, you know, pastor in a poor urban area ever, you know, and, and that was just the stupidest thing to ever say. And of course, uh, you know, God made it really clear that he was wanting me to go there. And, and I share that with you because, you know, where we were at, I mean, we had, you know, gang members, we had drug addicts. If you saw uh, Darren's uh, movie, uh, Father of Lights, uh, you, you saw that portion where Todd and I are praying for the gang members. Uh, that was happening in my church. That was filmed in the church where I had planted, uh, you know, I had planted uh, my church at. And so we were just, you know, surrounded. This is a real, it's a real broken community. And we went there, and everybody was saying, "Don't go there." Like the chief of police, I met with the chief of police, and uh, when we moved into town, and I sat down with him, and he said, "Where you're wanting to plant is actually the worst part of town." And he said, and if you go there, he says, it's not going to work. It's only all the churches in that area are moving out. None of them last. None of them, they just all die. And he said, uh, and it's one of the most violent areas of the city. But we had really felt that there was this thing about where things kind of were the darkest, that there could be a greater sense of breakthrough, that there would be a greater, where the light's shining there, that it just sort of beams out even more. And that there would be a sense, and, and where there's a higher level of desperation, that you'll see more kingdom activity. It's not the key to everything, but it is definitely makes a difference, definitely. And so we, we, we wanted to go plant there. And, and when we planted our church, if you, if you know our story, it's in the first chapter of that book, Do What Jesus Did. Uh, when we planted there, the, the, after, right before where, when Darren, when we filmed that, uh, they were telling us, the gang members were putting out word that that, that, ne that next year was going to be the bloodiest year in all of Aurora's history. One of the reasons why is we had been hitting the streets over and over and over again, praying for people, ministering to people just over and over and over and over and over again. We would tell people all the time, my, and I said, my best ministry, my best ministry is not in here. My best ministry is out there. That's always the case. My best ministry is out there. To me, this is an equipping center. This is an equipping center to send you out to go do your ministry. That's how I see it. And so I, I, we would tell people, you know, all the time, this, this is the place to equip you to go do your ministry. This isn't where you do your ministry. This equips you to go do your ministry. And so we would just hit the streets over and over. What happened is crime started dropping dramatically in Aurora. And it started, and I mean, at, at, when we moved there, 
The crime rate was so high, it was higher. The crime rate was higher than Chicago's crime rate. We were beating out Southside Chicago. I mean, that's bad, really bad. And Aurora is, you know, only uh, 200,000 people. It's not that big. It's not that massive. But I mean, that just shows you how much was happening there. And so we began to just hit the streets, love people, minister to people, just share Jesus, and pray for it. My kids, my kids have, have been beaten. Have they been, you know, knocked out, drug out to the middle of the road to be run over by cars to be killed? A matter of fact, uh, it was most amazing when my, my oldest son just uh, got married two years ago and at his... Uh, at his, uh, at his wedding, uh, this one, his best man stood up to give a toast, and he just started speaking of, of Judah's uh, bravery. And he goes, how many of you have heard that story, you know, where, where Judah was drug out to the middle of the road, and they tried to, you know, so that he'd be run over by cars and killed because he was preaching at the high school? And people raised their hand. He goes, well, I just want you to know, I was the guy who knocked him out and drug him out to the middle of the road to kill him. And he said, he saved my life because he didn't stop preaching the gospel. And I mean, man, we just, that's, this is just where we lived. This was just a part of a life. But we just saw this incredible. But after that movie, that was a big, significant shift. Because after what you saw happen in that room that day, uh, crime was dropping. And that's why they were threatening, you know, to start the war. But after that, I mean, these are the top brass. Everything changed. Um, that next year, we did not have, for a full calendar year, we did not have one homicide in Aurora, Illinois. That had not happened for 67 years. They ended up laying off a third of the police staff because the police officers were complaining about being bored. And guys, you have to understand, it was just us going after it again and again and again and just being bulldogs and not stopping and just praying for people, ministering to people and just not, not stopping. All the expert told us we were fools. And we would, we would crash and burn. It was a terrible mistake, and it would never, ever work. And I can tell you that all that was proven wrong. Because there comes a point where you start listening more to what the Spirit says than what the circumstances say. Circumstances will lie to you, and they will deceive you. you know, but, but, but what the Spirit says doesn't. Now, with that in mind, I want to take a look at this passage Luke chapter 5, if you, if you want to turn to your Bibles, if you just want to look on the screen, I think we've got it there. But now let me, let me just explain something here. You guys are used to hearing Chad preach. I've hung around Chad a little bit, and what I have concluded is he's a very smart man. He's brilliant, really, really smart, really brilliant, have a great respect for his knowledge of the Word of God, okay? So you've got a really smart pastor, but you got me this morning. <laughs> Bring that bar down a little bit, okay? Just remember, I've been pastoring in the hood for 17 years. He says words I don't even understand, okay? So just, just bring that bar down. You gotta realize half my church was on methadone trying to get off heroin. And so I was having to be like, you know, just to keep them awake so they wouldn't fall asleep. So I'm a little bit louder, much more obnoxious, and I may break things down way too simple for you. So, okay, give me grace to do that. Plus, I know I'm in the Southeast. Don't unbuckle that belt and beat me with it, okay? <laughs> Would you please give me grace to sort of exegete a passage that you may shed a little bit of a different light on it and to sort of read into that text a little bit. Would you, would you do that? Would that be okay? Now, how many of you know Luke is a man? <laughs> See, that's how far I had to break it down in my church. Luke is a man, okay? And, and how many of you ladies know men skip details? <laughs> See, you're wiser women than the first service, because I only think one of them raised their hand. But any woman who did not just raise your hand, I'm not sure you know a man. Because here's the deal. On the back of all of our man cards is this one little line. It says, must skip details, especially with wife, or this thing gets pulled. And so none of us want to lose that. You know what I mean? I was on a trip uh, to Zimbabwe with, uh, with, with, with a, a team for uh, t almost three weeks. And I mean, we almost got arrested and, you know, all this other stuff. It's crazy. When I get back, my wife picks me up from the airport at O'Hare and she says, well, how did it go? I gave her a five minute, five to 10 minute version of what happened over, you know, uh, 20 days. You know, that why? Because men skip details. 
Luke is a man, he has written this, plus he's writing it 75 years, 85 years later. So this is not what we call one of the synoptic gospels. I learned that word from listening to Chet, synoptic gospels. Um, I'm not sure what it means, but just stick with me on that part. But uh, anyway, so he, he, this is not one of those that's being written in real time. So, so let's give Luke a little grace and let me sort of fill in the blanks here a little bit. Would you let me do that? You let me do that? Okay. So how many of you grew up in church, Sunday school, catechism classes? Anybody grew up in that? Now, for those of us who grew up in church, how many of you remember flannel graph? You know what they call it in England? Fuzzy felt. <laughs> fuzzy felt. Can I get that water down there, please? They call it fuzzy felt. Now, here's the thing. You and I have heard, the, we've heard these stories in the Bibles. Thank you so much. We've heard these stories in the Bible so many times, over and over and over, until we've become inoculated to the power of the surprise of the story. We're so used to hearing them that we anticipate what's going to happen next. And so we forget that these guys were living in something where Jesus is telling them to do something. They don't know what's going to happen. You know, putting, putting enough fish and bread in 12 guys' hands and they're walking out to feed, you know, uh, groups of hundreds and fifties that make up 5,000 people with this is crazy. And they don't know the outcome. It's not like Jesus says, oh, by the way, it's gonna multiply as you do that. He doesn't tell them that. So you have to keep that in mind. They're kind of going into a lot of this blight. We're not even sure Jesus knew what was gonna happen next. We're not even sure why, because he came, according to Philippians chapter two, as a normal human being. He had put aside his superhero God powers he came as a normal human being, and what was the source of his power? Power of the Holy Spirit. That was the source of his power. Same Holy Spirit's available to you and I. So Jesus is not coming with any greater advantage, okay? So keep that in mind as we read this. By the way, you know what the new flannel graph is? Veggie tales. Veggie, for you younger people, it's sort of like veggie tales, flannel graph. You have no idea. See, our, our flannel graph, my parents also pastored in the hood, and ours, our flannel graphs was donated to us from the First Baptist Church of Chattahoochee, so ours was a little tattered, a little torn. So I grew up thinking Peter was an amputee. <laughs> Somebody had torn off Peter's leg, and I just thought he was an amputee. Okay, so let's take a look at the text. We'll read the text, and then I'm going to expound on the text, okay? All right, verse 1. One day Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee... Great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them, and they were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push out into the water. So he sat in the boat, and he taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now, let's go out where it's deeper, let down your nets, and catch some fish. Okay? That's what the text says. But... Remember, Luke is a man and men skip details. So allow me to sort of expound on this a little bit. So what I think this really looked like, how many of you know how long these guys had been fishing the night before? All night. All night. How much fish had they caught? No. no fish. How many of you know fishermen without fish are not pleasant? <laughs> They're not pleasant to be around. Half of my cousins grew up in South Georgia. The other half, you know, grew up in Houston, Texas. My, my, my cousins are so redneck. They cannot have a conversation with me as a man without a fishing pole in their hands. I mean, if, they, if I'm like, hey, Donnie, how you doing? How's everything going? He's like, hey, doing good, doing good. Things are good, you know? <laughs> you know, they never talk like this face to face. It's got to be like this, side by side. You just can't have that kind of conversation. So... You know, we, I understand this, and when they don't catch fish, we, every time we have a family gathering that's gotta be near a body of water, or we can't have it, because they won't show. So anyway, you, you know nothing about what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> You've got family like that, I'm sure, too. But all of a sudden, these guys haven't caught any fish, and I think it looks something like this. Peter's over there, and Peter is, he's, he's getting pressure. Now, Jesus is preaching to this crowd, and the crowd is pushing up against him. He can't get any further without getting wet by getting into the water. 
You know, they're pressing in. Anybody knows that when you speak publicly without a sound system, you've got to get distance from your crowd in order to project to them to hear you. If you don't, if they're on top of you, all the sound's blocked and people can't hear past three or four people. So Jesus is like, I can't get any further back without getting wet. So he looks over and Peter is over there. They're cleaning their nets from cleaning. And I think it looks something like this. Peter's over there. Get that seaweed out of those nets. Are those seashells? Get those out of there. Is that a Coke can? Get it out of there. Get that flip-flop out of that net. I can't believe people are throwing their garbage in this lake. Don't they know we have to fish in this lake? I have to go home to the wife. She's going to say, where's the money? Where's the fish? I'm going to say, we don't have any money. We don't have any fish. And my mother-in-law lives with us. <laughs> She's going to say, I told you you should have married Barnabas. He's an accountant. He's bringing home a paycheck. <laughs> I hate this job. Luke doesn't say any of that. Ladies, men skip details, right? About that time, Jesus steps over and he says, hey, Peter. Would you lend me your boat? I imagine Peter looks and says, you know what? You can have the stupid boat. I hate these boats. I hate these nets. I hate this job. Right now, if eBay was here, I'd sell it for five bucks, but it's not. So I want to chop it up and sell it as firewood. Yes, take the boat. And Jesus is like, dude, I only want to borrow your boat. And he's like, please take it. So he climbs in the boat, pushes out a little. Peter and his crew go back to cleaning the nets. Right about the time, they get their nets perfectly clean. All the seaweed's out, all the Coke cans are out, everything's out, all the bicycle tires are out. And right as they go to hang them up in the nice, warm, Middle Eastern sun so they can dry, come back the next night, do it all over again, they're grabbing their lunch pails, they're heading home. Right as they're walking away, Jesus goes, hey, Peter, I've got an idea. Let's go fishing. <laughs> Has it ever occurred to you that's a crazy idea? I imagine Peter goes, you're not from around here, are you? <laughs> Maybe you don't realize, but you are in the Middle East. And here in the Middle East, fish are cold-blooded creatures. When the sun comes out, do you see that yellow disc in the sky? That's called the sun. When it comes out, fish go low. They're trying to get as far away from that thing as possible. That's why we fish at night. But we were fishing last night. We caught nothing because there's no fish there to catch. You need to go build an armoire. You know nothing about fishing. But then Peter says something absolutely spectacular. He says, but because you say so, we will. Don't forget that line. Because you say so, we will. Can you imagine Peter trying to coax his crew back in the boat? Come on, guys, let's get back. And they're like, no, Peter, we're tired. We've been fishing all night. We haven't caught anything. No, we're not going back. We need to go home and rest so we can come back and do it tomorrow night. No, this is crazy. And Peter's like, oh, please, oh, please. Maybe he'll give a tip or something, something to get my mother-in-law off my back. And they're like, no, we're not going. They're like, Peter, all the other crews are watching. Are you crazy? No, we're not going. He's like, come on, come on, come on. Let's just get this over with. He coaxes them in the boat. What about all those other crews? How do they respond? I imagine they're looking over going, hey, Peter, where are you going? Are you going fishing? Hey, look at crazy Peter. He thinks there's actually fish out there. And Peter's like, no, I don't. I really don't. And they're like, hey, look, crazy Peter. He's taking fishing tri trips, trips from, from the carpenter who thinks he's a rabbi. Look at him as Peter does the row of shame <laughs> out to the middle of the lake. Finally, Peter gets out there and he's like, all right, you want a fishing demonstration? This is what it looks like. You stand at the edge of the boat. You take nets that are now wet and heavy that should be dry and lighter. You throw them over the side like this and you wait for fish. May I point out that are not there? That's what it looks like. 
you better give me a tip. And then Jesus goes, Peter. This is the same story, barring from one of the other gospels, same scenario. I know what's wrong. You see, you have your net on the wrong side <laughs> of the boat. It's simple. If you pick your net up from this side of the boat and you put it over there on that side of the boat, <laughs> you catch fish. <laughs> Peter's like, really? Really? Let me get this straight, Jesus. You, you really think six, eight feet over, lying under the brim of the water, there are fish under there going, <laughs> they have their net on the wrong side of the boat. They think we're over there, but we're over here. Shh, they'll never know. Trust me, Jesus, that's not happening. But because you say so, we will. And the crew's like, Peter, don't do it. All the other crews are watching back at Peter, don't. We will be the laughing stock of the fishing industry here in Galilee. Don't do it. He's like, guys, let's just get this over with. Come on. And so they're pulling up their nets, and the other guys are like, hey, Peter. <laughs> you think there's fish on the other side of the What are you doing? Hey, look at crazy Peter. He's lost his mind. And he's like, don't laugh. And he's like, all right, I told you there was no fish over here. See, there's no fi fish. Fish, we got fish. Pull that net up. They pull the net up, drops a load of fish in the boat. Throw it over again. They throw it over again. It fills up again. He pulls it up, drops it up, throw it over again. He's like, they were under there all night. <laughs> <laughs> Laughing at us. We were on the wrong side of the boat. The Bible says the boat fills with fish so much so it's starting to see Peter's like I've got another boat back ashore and he's like hey get that boat out here we got fish not that side of the boat <laughs> it cracks me up every time <laughs> put it on the other side put an X on it <laughs> that's where we fish from from here on out <laughs> that's the hot spots <laughs> The Bible says both boats so filled with fish, they barely make it back to shore, sinking all the way as they go. Peter gets back to the shore, and it hits Peter. I'm an expert fisherman. I know my trade. I have the skills to catch fish. Peter realized it wasn't in his skill, it wasn't in his ability, it wasn't in his technique. The difference was the presence that was in the boat. The presence in the boat made all the difference. The Bible says Peter gets back to shore, he jumps out of the boat, and he drops to his knees in front of Jesus. He says, oh, Jesus, you need to go away from me. You need to get as far away from me as possible. Anybody as good as you are should not be this close to a guy as bad as I am. You hang around me. I'll disappoint you. I pretty much disappoint everybody. Yeah, Jesus, you should, you should just go now. And Jesus goes, oh, Peter, you don't get it. You spent your life chasing minnows. I didn't make you to catch fish. I made you to catch people. 
I made you for the big catch. And you've been chasing minnows your whole life. What Jesus says next is not that spectacular. And he looks at Peter and he goes, Peter, follow me. Have you ever noticed there's not much of a pitch in that? It's not like salespeople are studying that technique <laughs> to get people to come along on stuff. It's not much there. Follow me. What did Peter want? Fish. What did Jesus give him? Fish. But the Bible says Peter abandons the boats, the nets, the fish to follow Jesus. Peter probably had been crying out to God all night long the night before for those fish. And the scripture says he abandons them to follow Jesus. You see, Peter wanted fish, but you know what Jesus wanted? Because you say so, we will. When it doesn't make sense. When it doesn't add up. Jesus is saying, I can build a church on that that can stand thousands of years of persecution and thrive and grow and it will make hell shake just simply because you say so. We will. When it doesn't make sense. You see, guys, those fish and those boats and those nets, that was all a prophetic picture. Jesus was showing Peter what he wanted to do with Peter's life because that boat, when he said, will you lend me your boat? He was saying, Peter, if you'll lend me your life, we'll do far more than you could ever do. You let me put my presence on your boat. We'll catch far more. We'll make greater impact than you could ever catch. I just need your boat. Let me put my presence on your boat. That was a prophetic picture that would later be fulfilled in Acts chapter two, just like those fish into those nets with thousands running to be a part of the church on the day of Pentecost at the sound of the presence on these boats. It was a prophetic picture. Will you lend him your boat? Matthew's a tax collector. He's there with a table filled with money. Jesus walks by and just says, hey, Matthew, follow me. And the Bible says Matthew forsakes his table, probably filled with cash, to follow Jesus, just simply because you say so. Can you imagine these guys walking past their family members? I'm sorry, where are you going? To follow him? To do what? He didn't say. <laughs> For how long? He didn't say that either. And why are you doing this? Because everything inside of me says, wherever that presence is, that's where I have to be. I don't care what I have to leave behind. I don't care what I have to do. I've got to be in hot pursuit of it. Amen. I've got to have that on my boat, no matter what it costs me. Will you lend him your boat? Will you lend him your boat when it can mean your life? Will you lend him your boat when it can mean your reputation? One day at our church, we had the number two gang leader in the Latin Kings. The Latin Kings was the largest gang outside of like the mafia in the Chicago area. And he started, his girlfriend started coming to our church and she came and after uh, coming for several months, I, I do a talk every, every year on sex. And I explain what sex is. Sex is God's blessing on marriage. And it's the best sex is in marriage. And no matter where you're at in relationships or what, God can 
clear the slate. He can give you a clean slate. Give you, but the best sex is always in marriage. God wants the best for his children. Marriage clearly defined in scriptures between a man and a woman. Anything outside of that is not God's, God doesn't bless. And he wants us to be blessed. And so I share that and get up and afterwards, Elena, the girl, this guy's street name is Hitler. And so she goes back home to Hitler and she goes, I'm not having sex with you anymore. Because Robbie said, (laughs) sex outside of marriage is sin and it breaks God's heart and I'm not going to break God's heart, so I'm not having sex with you anymore. And you can imagine how he responded. This warm feeling comes across him. (laughs) Tears begin to flow down his cheeks. And he says, I love Robbie. That's a real man of God. (laughs) Sort of my fantasy of how he responded. That's not how he responded. He looks at her and he goes, you go tell that preacher that I'm coming there next Sunday and I'm gonna sit on the front row and if he doesn't get up and take it back, I'm gonna pop him in the head in front of the whole church. She calls me on the phone and she's crying and she goes, Robbie, you cannot get up and preach part two next week. She goes, don't do it. She goes, please. She goes, he will do it. She goes, you know Hitler, he's a killer, please don't. And I said, he's not gonna show it. She goes, yes, he will. She goes, Robbie, please, have Carlos Lopez, the worship pastor, get up and preach it instead. And I'm like, (laughs) that's your plan? He gets popped in the head instead of me. I'm like, no, we're not doing that. And she's like, well, he came out of that same gang. Maybe they'll, he'll show a little grace. I'm like, no, we're not doing that. I said, he's not gonna show, he's just mouthing off. He'll cool down. I said, you stay with what Jesus was telling you to do and the Lord will bless you. And I said, but he's not gonna show up. He, he won't show up. She goes, yes, he will. I was like, he won't. So that next Sunday, I'm in my little office and kind of pulling some stuff together, preparing part two, recapping part one. And Carlos comes running in and he busts in the office and he's like, dude. And that's sort of like saying pastor in our community. He's like, dude. He goes, Hitler's downstairs. He just walked in the door and dude, he's strapping. He's got a gun under his shirt, under, under, in his belt. And he's like, he's strapping, dude. And he goes, dude, please don't ask me to disarm him. And I'm like, no, no. I said, you saw the gun. Yeah, I saw the gun. I said, all right. I said, do this. I said, tell Nicole, the girl who's going to do announcements. I'm doing announcements instead. He goes, you want to do worship too? And I'm like, no, no, no. You're doing worship. I'm going to do announcements. I'll preach. And he's like, okay. I said, don't tell anybody. I said, don't tell anybody. I said, let's just keep our eye on him. So we go downstairs. And I wish I could say like I was just super confident and courageous. But I get up and my hands are shaking. I'm like, well, I'm in here. They're so happy to have all of you here. So glad you're here with us today. And you know, people are in the back of the church going, oh, the Holy Spirit find Robbie Elbert. <laughs> oh, Lord, it's just so wonderful. And I'm moving really fast. And I'm like, children's ministry over here, bathrooms over here, coffee and donuts here. Man, I'm moving quick. If he's going to take a shot, he better be fast. <laughs> I ain't going to make it easy for him. And so I do part two, I do a recap on part one, completely cover part one, and so I finish up, the whole time he's sitting there, and his head's cocked to the side, and he's looking straight ahead, and I'm moving back and forth, his eyes never move, and I'm like, what's going on? (laughs) I finished the message, didn't alter a thing, and then I had some words of knowledge, we had some ministry time, some people came up, and all of a sudden I look at him, and he goes, he goes, and he gets up, and he just walks out quietly, and I'm like, what happened? So later that afternoon, I called her on the phone. And I said, hey, I said, you know, did, did he come home? And she goes, yeah. And I said, what happened? And she goes, he just came home and said, those people are crazy. I'm never going back there ever again. And she goes, what happened there? And I said, nothing. He just sat there looking blank the whole time. She goes, that's really weird. She goes, well, he won't talk about it. Several weeks passed. And the Aurora Police Department, along with the Chicago Police Department, did a sting on the on the on the Latin Kings in the Chicago land. They arrested 24 of the top Latin Kings. We got a picture. I forgot to show this on the other service. We got a picture. This was on the front page of the Chicago Tribune. And that stripe coming down, where it says "under the rest," all the way to the end, where it's covering that guy's eyes on this side, that's Hitler. Second from the bottom, that's Hitler there. You can leave that up for a few minutes. But anyway, his, his brother, who is a drug dealer who goes to our church, his, his street name is Pistol Pete. And I went to him and I said, um, 
I said, Pete, I said, you go, it's really Pedro. I said, you know, Pedro, I said, you go tell, uh, you go tell Hitler that I'm coming to see him in jail. And he goes, Robbie, he doesn't want to see you. And I said, dude, I said, tell him I'm coming to see him. He said, he's there in isolation. I can't get word to him. I said, don't lie to me. You tell him I'm coming to see him. <laughs> and he says, okay. So I went there the next week and he came in, he had the orange jumpsuit on, he's shackled, his hands are cuffed, and he's shuffling. I've never seen anybody so angry in my entire life. And he comes in, the, he comes shuffling in, and he looks at me, and he goes, what do you want? And I said, well, I want to talk to you. And I had no plan. I had no idea what I was going to say. And I said, I want to talk to you. And he goes, well, I got a question for you. I said, what's that? He goes, what did you do to me that day I came to your church? I said, what are you talking about? He goes, what did you do? He goes, I was going to pop you in the head in front of the whole church. And he goes, as soon as I sat in that seat, I was frozen and I couldn't move. He goes, did you hex me? I was like, no, I didn't hex you. And he goes, what did you do to me? And I said, dude, I didn't do anything. I said, dude, here's the deal, Hitler. I said, that was Jesus keeping you from doing something stupid. I said, bro, you, you've, you, you don't understand how God works. I said, that was God keeping you from doing something that was going to hurt you. I said, Hitler, here's the deal. I said, I've come here to tell you what Jesus came to do. And I just basically sort of communicated the gospel to him. Shared with him. I said, but Hitler, I said, here's the deal. I said, like, this is the life that you've built for yourself. And you thought it was the best life and it was going to get you respect, which really means fear and gang lingo. And I said, it was going to get you respect, and it was going to get you all of this stuff. It was going to get you money, all this stuff. And I said, and all of it is turned up to be jacked up, twisted, and messed up. This dream life that you thought was the perfect life for you. And I said, but on the other side of the table, Jesus is making you a deal right now. And he's saying, Hitler, here's the life that I always designed for you to live. And I made you to live, but you settled for the jacked up, twisted life. Hitler, I just want to do an exchange. Let me take the jacked up, twisted life, and I'll give you the life you were always meant to live. And I said, Hitler, that's the deal Jesus has on the table for you. Would you like to take the deal? He shoves away from the table, and he goes, that deal's not for me. He goes, that deal's for people like you and Mother Teresa and Billy Graham. He goes, Robbie, I've gone too far. He says, they've got six murder charges on me. He goes, that's nothing. He said, Robbie, he goes, I've strapped men to the steering wheels inside of cars. And I've tied their feet together to where they couldn't leave. And I poured gas on them. I set them on fire. And I looked through the windshields. And I laughed at them as they died, begging me for their lives. He said, that deal's not for me. I've gone too far. And I said, oh, Hitler. I said, dude, you don't get it. He said, Hitler, this is the Bible. We call this the holy word of God. I said, this portion of the Bible is called the New Testament. I said, Hitler, half of it was written by a murderer who was torturing and murdering God's own people. And Jesus chose him to write what we read as his very own voice today. I said, oh, Hitler, don't you see the deal? It's still on the table. And he dropped his head and he just burst into tears. And he said, I'll take the deal. And right there, we prayed together and I saw this hard, cold, angry Murderer, give his life to Jesus. His brother, just tears streaming down his face. I told his brother the next week about it, and he goes, you saw Hitler cry? And I said, yeah, and he goes, Robbie, I've never seen my brother cry. He said, even when he was six years old, and I would watch my stepdad beat him till he was nearly dead, and I never saw him shed one tear. He said, I only saw him ever laugh when he was torturing somebody. Because you saw Hitler cry. I said, yeah. And as Hitler lifted his head from saying this prayer, this huge smile came across his face and he began to giggle like a little kid. And he's rolling his shoulders and he goes, it's gone. It's gone. He 
She says, it's really gone. And I said, Hitler, what's gone? And he said, all the anger, the rage, the pain, the hatred. He goes, it's all snapped off my back as soon as I said that prayer. It's like right out of Pilgrim's Progress, man. He says, it's really gone. About the time the guard comes in and says, time to go back to your cell. Hitler jumps up and salutes and says, yes, sir. And the guard's like, whoa. <laughs> he looks at me and I was like. <laughs> I would go back every other week and we would sit down together and we'd go through the scripture together. Hitler could barely read. So I had to get him a children's picture Bible. And he would sit there and he would look at these goofy little cartoons and as we would sit there and go through scripture and go over these stories and he would look at them and just be intrigued by them. He would ask questions, great questions. As we go through and we talked about doing what Jesus says, no matter what, no matter if it makes sense or not, because God is smarter than we are and we're going to acknowledge what he says and not try to make him do what we say because we think we're smarter. And so we sit there and we go through this and he would just look and listen and ask questions. We went back and forth for weeks. Finally, after weeks of this, Hitler, one day, he lifts his head after we're going through the life of Paul and he goes, Robbie? And I said, yeah, Hitler. He said, I gotta get my story out. And I said, what do you mean? He says, Robbie, People don't know how far Jesus will go for them. He says, Robbie, I don't, I don't think anybody's telling them. He says, you can hate God. You can hate everybody. And he never stops. He just keeps coming after you. And coming after you. And coming after you. And he just doesn't. Stop. You send a guy that you want to kill to tell you. This life you never knew was there for you. He said, Robbie, people don't know that. I really don't think anybody's telling them. And I looked at him and I said, dude, I love you. I said, but Hitler, if you tell your story, I said, dude, that could get you the needle. Or that could get you popped by the kings. And I said, dude, I don't want you to die. You know what he said to me? He yelled up that children's picture Bible and he said, you told me they all died for this. He said, you told me this was worth giving everything for. He said, now you're trying to tell me I should try to save my own skin. He said, Robbie, the past few months in this stinking, rotten prison have been the best months of my entire life. If they took me out today, it would be worth it. He goes, Robbie, people don't know how far Jesus will go. Somebody has to tell them. And I looked at him and I'm like, dude, you get it. All that we, the church, would get it the way Hitler gets it. Will you lend him your boat? Will you lend him your boat when it can mean your life? It's almost a romantic notion to be willing to take a bullet to the head for Jesus. Many of us would raise our hands for that. We just don't want to look stupid for him. We get to worry just as much about our reputation as Jesus worried about his. Will we just say with everything inside of us, because you say so, we will. We will. Bow your heads if you would, please. There's a lot of boats in this room right now. If you're just here and you're just saying, I'm willing to give you my boat no matter what. No matter what I look like, no matter what anybody thinks. I just got to have your presence on my boat. No matter what I look like. If that's you, just stand right now. kids and kids. 
kids ministry, you probably should slip out quietly and get them. There's a lot of courage standing in this room right now. Just put your hands out if you would. Come, Holy Spirit. beginning to feel tingling and heat on your body or your legs are shaking or your heart's racing or you're just feeling a heaviness on you right now if that's you raise your hand wherever you're at raise your hand that's God's presence on you if you have your hand raised just do me a favor just come down here to the front if you would some of you that are still back at your seats that you're feeling tingling or heat on your fingertips or your hands or you're feeling it across the back of your neck or your shoulders if you're feeling that raise your hands if you're back at your seat right now if you have your hand raised come down here too I'm also talking about you others of you you're feeling just tingling or heat around your lips or your mouth or your tongue if you're feeling tingling or heat on there or just even a heaviness on there Whether you're back at your seat or you're up here, raise your hand if you're feeling that on you. Raise your hand if you're feeling that around your mouth or on your tongue or anywhere. And then also those in your hands. Holy Spirit, turn it up now. Turn it up, Holy Spirit, right now. By the authority of Christ, increase. Ruin us with your presence. Make us undone. fire of God fall fall in this house fall in this place be filled let his presence permeate your boats let it permeate every part of your being right now be filled be filled be filled fill them up Lord more Lord more Lord Be filled. More, Lord. More, Lord. Turn it up, Holy Spirit. Those who are feeling that in your hands, raise your hands right now. That's healing, anointing, and power, and that's a release of manifest presence to release to others. Father, just let that move its way down our arms and into our chest right now. Just let that just fill us with the Father heart of God right now. If you're feeling that move down your arms into your chest, wave your hand right now. More, Lord. Turn it up, Holy Spirit. Those of you that are standing back, you're not feeling that, but you want that. If that's you, just step out. Even if you're stepping into the aisle, just step out and say, I want that. As you respond, you'll begin to receive. Fill us up, Holy Spirit. More, Lord. More, Lord. Fire of God. More, Lord.
close today with if you need, still need to receive ministry you stay here the band will send us out if you need to get your kids we need you to go get your kids downstairs just leave whenever you're ready the Holy Spirit still ministering you stay here